Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hi guys, um, I didn't plan on making a episode today, but I feel like it. I hope you guys all had a good Christmas, or good day if you don't celebrate it. Let's go. Uh, History of Poland, the Deluge, there's a part one and two here. Uh, yeah, let's do it. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. Let's go. Meet 17th century Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the largest and most prosperous state in Eastern Europe. Yet 150 years later, the country was no more. All of its lands had been divided by its neighbors and its existence soon a distant memory. So what happened? This is the story of the deluge, the beginning of the end of the Commonwealth. This story began from seemingly unconnected events. In the 16th century, the Commonwealth's nobles began to burden the peasants more and more. Many peasants sought to escape their servitude. At the same time, there was a frontier where there were no nobles to pay taxes to and free land for everyone that could till it. And that is where many of them set foot. No, it was not the new world. Oh. It was the frontier in the steppes between the Commonwealth and the lands of the Tatars. The steppes were a lawless place, PvP. always in danger of Tatar raids, so the settlers had to be well armed and organized to survive and prosper. They became yep. known as the Cossacks. Eventually, the Commonwealth nobles caught up to them and wanted to bring the settlers back into serfdom. By that time, the Cossacks had grown in number and power. They claimed that by settling in the borderlands, they were in fact protecting the Commonwealth from Tatars and they should be paid for it. This led to a series of Cossack rebellions that were all put down and their rights were curtailed. By mid-century, the borderlands were a powder keg for a new rebellion. In 1648, another revolt began. The Commonwealth garrison forces moved out to suppress it. They divided themselves into three groups in order to quell the revolt quickly. Yeah. Two of them moved forward, while one stayed back as a reserve. However, the rebellion turned out to be stronger than expected. First, the Cossack contingent of the Commonwealth army defected to the rebels. Then the second force was encircled and destroyed. The Cossacks caught up with the reserve force and defeated it. The Commonwealth carries... <laughs> that worked out terribly for them. Okay. New well, good for the... Anyways. The Cossacks caught up with the reserve force and defeated it. The Commonwealth garrison in Ukraine was virtually wiped out. Soon the Orthodox peasants joined the Cossacks in rebellion and all of Ukraine fell to the rebels. But the Commonwealth had plenty of resources and sent yet another army against the Cossacks. However, due to the political nature of the nobles' democracy, military offices were often given out according to status and not merit. And here three different lords were put in command of the Commonwealth forces. The Cossacks exploited this deficiency and won another victory. Their hold over Ukraine was secured. During the crisis, the king of the Commonwealth had died and the nobles elected his brother, John Casimir of the House of Vasa to be the new king. He was to be the one to take the Commonwealth out of the crisis. The king took personal command of the army. After some inconclusive fighting, the Commonwealth was able to leverage its sizable militaries Winter Sars. superiority and the Cossacks and their allies were defeated. This put an end to their expansion. The Cossacks alone were not very formidable, but their strength was in their allies. They had made alliances with the Prince of Moldavia and the Crimean Tatars. The Commonwealth de decided to deal with the allies first and then take on the Cossacks. The Commonwealth's military expedition to Moldavia failed, so they resorted to diplomacy to make neighboring principalities invade Moldavia and depose its ruler. Moldavia was out, and it was time to deal with the Tatars. The Tatars' interest in the alliance with the Cossacks was the opportunity to raid the Commonwealth for loot and slaves. During a campaign, the Tatars would have to join the Cossacks, move into the Commonwealth, defeat the Commonwealth's forces, capture the slaves, then get safely home with the slaves and finally sell them on the Crimean slave markets for profit. John Casimir offered them a better deal. The Tatars won't support the Cossacks and they get paid. Tatars saw this as a better option and abandoned the cost profit. John Casimir offered them a better deal. The Tatars won't support the Cossacks and they get paid. Tatars saw this as a better option and abandoned the Cossacks. John Casimir prepared to conquer their lands for the Commonwealth. The Cossacks were now backed into a corner. They asked help from Russia and offered the Tsar to become his subjects in return for military aid. Okay, all right, so he went around to weaken his allies with deals, successfully so, and now he's getting ready for the final push. 
They asked help from Russia and offered the Tsar to become his subjects in return for military. Sorry, they asked Russia. Don Casimir prepared to conquer their lands for the Commonwealth. The Cossacks were now backed into a corner. They asked help from Russia and offered the Tsar to become his subjects in return for military aid. Russia wasn't as strong as the Commonwealth. It had lost several wars to the Commonwealth earlier and it didn't seem to be a good idea to start another. But the opportunity to become the dominant power was too good to pass on and Russia risked it. If Russia committed all of its forces to the struggle, it would be able to meet the strength of the Commonwealth. But it could afford to do that for only a few years. If the war couldn't be ended after the initial years, Russia was in trouble. So the Tsar put all the eggs into one basket and launched an all-out attack. In 1654, the Commonwealth sent its main force to the Ukraine against the Cossacks. Russia dispatched some forces to make sure that the Cossacks wouldn't be fully defeated. At the same time, the main force attacked in Lithuania. With the Commonwealth's main force in the south, Russia was able to catch them off balance and... Com okay, so it was... A, I, I thought maybe the Russians would send men into the area where the Cossacks were fighting, but they're launching an all-out offensive war right now. ...conquer the province of Smolensk. Meanwhile, in Sweden. Sweden dreamt of being Sir a great Stam. power. In order to achieve that, Charles? it saw the need to conquer all of the coastline of the Baltic Sea and turn it into a Swedish lake. By that time, it had already made some good progress in its conquest. Now, the neighboring countries weren't fond of this, and Sweden had created the most modern army in the region to protect its possessions. This army was very expensive to maintain, however, and Sweden wasn't the most prosperous country. So it had a habit of sending its army occasionally abroad to have their neighbors pay for it. In 1654, the treasury was running low once again, and the army needed to be sent out on another campaign. But the question was, where to send it? Three countries had their possessions near the Baltic. Denmark, the Holy Roman Empire, and Commonwealth, with its vassals. The Holy Roman Empire had just been devastated by the Thirty Years' War. Meanwhile, Denmark was small and relatively poor to sustain the Swedish army for a long time. Meanwhile, the lands of the Commonwealth were vast and had enjoyed a relative peace for decades. So, common... It seems like the Swedish army, very well-trained and professional army, but just not enough resources or men. It seemed like their only option would have been to force themselves into one of these areas and then conscript soldiers from either Denmark, the Holy Roman Empire, or Commonwealth here. Commonwealth it was. In the summer of 1655, okay. the Swedish army invaded the Commonwealth. Local nobles gathered to meet the enemy. However, after seeing the Swedish army, they figured that there was no way of defeating it head on. So they had to weigh other options. The Commonwealth was under attack from three different sides and needed a strong army and leadership that King John Casimir hadn't been able to provide. His detractors argued that the only way to save the Commonwealth was to recognize the Swedish King Charles as their king. With his powerful army, he would surely defeat Commonwealth's enemies. So the nobles decided to bend the knee to the Swedish King and recognize him as the King of the Commonwealth. Other provinces followed and soon the Swedish army entered Warsaw, the capital of the Commonwealth. The Swedes made it their goal to capture John Casimir. He hastily gathered an army, but it was no match to the Swedish forces and was easily defeated. The king fled to Krakow, but with the Swedes closely on his tail and with many of the Commonwealth's nobles defecting, he had no choice but to flee to the Holy Roman Empire. With the Swedish invasion, the Commonwealth's army fell into disarray. The resistance to Russia had collapsed. Its forces spread out, taking over large swaths of territory. The remaining soldiers and territories attempted to save themselves by swearing allegiance to the Swedish king. By the end of 1655, most of the Commonwealth found itself under foreign occupation. The Commonwealth had lost all of its armies and its king had fled the country. Was this the end? Well, no. Because in the next episode, the Commonwealth will strike back. Thank you to all the cap- That's cool. Alright, we're going into it. Two men, one goal. Only one will emerge victorious. In the red corner we have John Gazimir, the legitimate king of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. So far, his reign has been disastrous. Due to internal revolts and foreign invasions, the Commonwealth has lost most of its territory and John Gazimir himself was exiled. In the blue corner is one of the invaders, Charles Gustav, the king of Sweden, with one of the most modern armies in Europe. 
The dissenting nobles offered Charles Gustav to become the king of the Commonwealth, and as a result what was left of the country acknowledged his authority. In this episode, John Casimir and Charles Gustav will clash over the kingdom of Poland. Let's see. But how did it come to be that Charles Gustav, the king of Sweden, also became the king of the Commonwealth? We saw. In 1655, the Commonwealth was unable to stop the Cossack revolt and the Russian invasion. At that time, Sweden invaded the country from the west. The Swedish army was one of the best in Europe. The situation was desperate. I love, for some reason, I the love Swedish that. Army, it just says so much. I love that. It was one of the best in Europe. The situation was desperate. However, the nobles had an idea. If they acknowledged the Swedish king as their overlord, not only would they not have to fight the Swedish army, but they could use the Swedish army's help to recover the lands lost to Russia and the Cossacks. So Charles Gustav was acknowledged. I would say that's smart, but it, it seems like you really have no, uh, have no other choice. Acknowledged as the Commonwealth's king by the nobles, and his forces occupied the remaining parts of the kingdom of Poland. But there was a flaw in this plan. Charles Gustav was not interested in ruling the Commonwealth as its monarch and helping to restore its lands. His real goals were to annex the lands near the Baltic Sea into Sweden and also plunder the Commonwealth's territory. Well, in I think no matter what, that's not surprising. And no matter what, um, still better that than your imminent defeat from the, uh, you know, your older enemies over here in Russia and the Cossacks. But, which I guess you could say is a semi-civil war with the Cossacks. But at this point, even if you know Charles doesn't have the intention of, of course he's not going to just set up everything back hunky-dory like it was before and, and give you control of the Commonwealth um, or give the Commonwealth the ability to, to take back its lands. But it's still going to give them time to uh, think about some sort of betrayal, I guess, against Sweden. But let's see what happens. Instead of helping the Commonwealth in the war, the Swedish army started looting the country clean of valuables. Jeez. The Commonwealth's people became disappointed in the Swedish rule, and the tensions between the Protestant Swedish army and mostly Catholic Poles began to flare up. An anti-Swedish oh guerrilla campaign right. spread is... in the countryside, and many of the nobles considered defecting back to John Casimir. The Swedes' control over the country was weakened. John Casimir saw this as an opportunity and returned to the Commonwealth to lead the revolt against the Swedes. On paper, the Swedish forces were large, but the Commonwealth's nobles were disgruntled by the Swedish rule and refused to fight. Most of the Swedish army had to be dispersed in many garrisons to fight off guerrillas, and Charles Gustav was only able to field a small mobile force. And isn't this leaving himself really exposed? He relied on speed and aggression to crush the revolt. He quickly marched out to quell the rebellion before it could grow large and pushed into the territory controlled by John Casimir. However, by that time, John Casimir's army was far larger than the Swedish force. They chased the Swedes back and at one point managed to encircle Charles Gustav's army. Eventually, the Swedes managed to break free and regroup in Warsaw. It was clear to Charles Gustav that he needed a much larger army to defeat John Casimir, and he went abroad to raise one. Witnessing the success of the revolt, most of the Commonwealth's nobles defected to John Casimir, and from now on, the Swedish control over Poland relied only on their garrisons. So, the guy who had originally been at the head of, of Poland-Lithuania who fled was fighting the Cossacks, but after the inter intervening years with the, the Swedes... Are the Cossacks now on the same side, or are they all fighting together? John Casimir's forces took Warsaw. By that time, Charles Gustav was back with a decent-sized force. His plan was to use the quality of his troops to destroy John Casimir's army in battle. John Casimir was aware of the quality of the Swedish army, but he had gained several advantages. He had united the Commonwealth... So they must have been really good, the Swedes, if they have this reputation. Like, really good, since... Everyone around them seems to be scared of them. ...was behind him, and his forces had a considerable numerical advantage over the Swedes. Also, having Warsaw behind them benefited the morale of his army. He hoped that with the help of these advantages, he would best the Swedes on the battlefield. Okay. The battle ended in a Swedish victory, mm. and they entered Warsaw, but they weren't able to inflict heavy casualties on John Casimir's army. In this situation, neither side could achieve full victory. Both sides changed strategies. 
John Casimir still had many more men than Charles Gustav. He planned to use it to engage the Swedes in a large number of smaller engagements, where the Swedish advantages in tactics and firepower were smaller, and ultimately defeat the Swedish army in a war of attrition. Charles Gustav's main problem was the lack of manpower. Bringing a massive army of mercenaries to the region was too expensive and would take too much time. The Commonwealth's neighbors had many troops nearby, but Charles Gustav still had to pay them somehow. Well, he could pay them by allocating them land in Poland that they would conquer together. So he decided to draw in the smaller nations by partitioning the Commonwealth between its smaller neighbors. Brandenburg, Transylvania and the Cossacks answered his call. Sweden would keep the lands near the sea. The elector of Brandenburg would get northwest, the Cossacks would get the east, and the prince of Transylvania would get the rest. John Casimir's forces were clearly outmatched. He had only bad options. He could meet the invading armies in battle, but the odds of victory were small, and if he was defeated, he could lose most of his army. That would mean losing the war. On the other hand, he could harass the enemy forces and keep his army together as long as possible and hope for the best. But this would only postpone his ultimate defeat, as it would make his lands fully exposed to the invaders, and it would only be a question of time until the Commonwealth's population would be plundered into submission. He chose the latter option. In the next year, the Allies invaded the Commonwealth. John Casimir's forces were not able to contain their advance. The Cossacks and the Transylvanians moved in from the south and went towards Krakow. On their way, they put the Lesser Poland to fire and sword. After reinforcing the Swedish garrison in Krakow, they moved north to meet up with the Swedish army. Having joined forces with the Swedes, their combined army now marched through central Poland, burning and looting on their path. They established a garrison in the region. Finally, they turned their sights at Warsaw, which John Casimir's forces had regained in the meantime. The Allies moved in and took the town without much trouble. The campaign so far had been a success, and in time the Allies would be able to gain full control over Poland. The Swedish successes had antagonized many of the European powers, and by that time Sweden found itself in a war with Russia, Denmark and the Holy Roman Emperor. This was more than Sweden could manage, but Charles Gustav Great knew the solution to this problem. He had to knock one of its enemies out of the war fast. The question was, which one? Russia and the Holy Roman Emperor were too large to defeat quickly, and he had to choose between the Commonwealth and Denmark. Sweden was winning the war against the Commonwealth, but with John Casimir not willing to make peace, it would still take some years to conquer it completely. Charles Gustav left a strong garrison in his partition of the Commonwealth and chose to attack Denmark. The Danes thought that Charles Gustav would bring his army back to Sweden to defend his country from the Danish invasion and position their troops accordingly. But Charles Gustav took another route from the south. He surprised the Danish defenders and easily took over Jutland, but wow. was separated from the rest of Denmark by the Danish Straits. Unfortunately for the Danes, the winter that year had proved to be especially cold and the Straits froze. Swedes crossed the sea wow. on ice and soon the Swedish army was before Copenhagen, the Danish capital. Confronted with the possibility of losing his capital, they the king of marched over the sea. That sounds so amazing. Den They're cool. Denmark offered Charles Gustav many of his lands in return for peace. Just as he planned, Charles Gustav had quickly knocked Denmark out of the war. But things were going bad for Sweden in the Commonwealth. John Casimir's decision to keep his army intact had proven to be the right one. With Swedish army gone, Sweden's allies were not able to match the strength of the Commonwealth's army. Faced with unfavorable odds, the Transylvanians began their retreat from Warsaw to regroup in the south. John Casimir's forces followed and harassed them on the march, and finally the whole force was surrounded. In return for a safe passage home, the Prince of Transylvania agreed to leave the Swedish alliance and relinquish all of his conquests. Transylvania was out of the war. Now it was time to deal with Brandenburg. Brandenburg's army was similar to that of Sweden, and here John Casimir resorted to diplomacy instead of warfare. Officially, the East Prussian domains of Brandenburg were owned by the Commonwealth, and Brandenburg administered them as a vassal. John Casimir offered Brandenburg full control over East Prussia if it was to change the site. Domains of Brandenburg were owned by the Commonwealth, and Brandenburg administered them as a vassal. So 
so what's the difference? So they own the land, but it's kind of governed by by Brandenburg? John Casimir offered Brandenburg full control over East Prussia if it was to change the sides in the war. Brandenburg agreed and pulled back its forces and declared war on Sweden. By that time, the army of the Holy Roman Emperor arrived in the region. Now Sweden's enemies on the southern coast of the Baltic Sea heavily outnumbered the Swedish army, and despite knocking Denmark out of the war, Sweden's position had not improved. It seemed that Sweden would not be able to win the war, but Charles Gustav was still optimistic and looked for the target he could strike next. A campaign in the southern Baltic did not promise easy victory, but there was a place where achieving victory was more than probable. It was Denmark. Swedish forces occupied a lot of the country since the previous war, and all the land Denmark directly controlled besides its Norwegian domains was the area around its capital. Charles Gustav decided to take Copenhagen, and this time not only knock Denmark out of the war... It's crazy just how islandy Denmark is. I know it's a great word, but... Even like the mainland, that you, when you think of Denmark, this big peninsula sticking out of the, the head of Germany over here, it really is carved up a lot, and a lot of it just is not connected. ...decided to take Copenhagen, and this time not only knock Denmark out of the war, but also out of existence, and annex the Danish mainland into Sweden. He landed his army near Copenhagen and began the siege. But then the Dutch joined the war against Sweden and sent their fleet to help Copenhagen. With a stream of reinforcements and supplies coming to Copenhagen, Charles Gustav was not able to take the town. At the same time, they were unable to leave the Danish islands due to the naval blockade. Meanwhile, the coalition's forces captured many of Sweden's fortresses on the southern Baltic. So what's the deal with the Netherlands at this point? Because they were dominated by the Spanish, right? And I'm not sure about the British. I'd like to learn about that, about the Netherlands. They also moved into Denmark and slowly pushed the Swedish army out of most of the country. Sweden had lost many of its conquests. Then Charles Gustav fell ill and died. The new Swedish government decided to cut their losses and make peace. By that time, Sweden had still retained some of their fortresses in their partition of the Commonwealth, but they had lost their positions in Germany. They agreed to trade their fortresses in the Commonwealth for the return of their domains in Germany, and soon the last Swedish soldiers left the Commonwealth and the Swedish invasion was over. John Casimir had won. He hadn't managed to best the Swedish army on the battlefield, but he was able to outlast the Swedish war effort and had gained full control over Poland. But his work was far from complete. Russia and the Cossacks still controlled more of the Commonwealth's territory than the Commonwealth itself. I just want to say, looking back at it now, at the start of this whole thing, it seems almost inevitable that it it all turned out the way it did because Sweden didn't seem... It seems like all of these places weren't very close with anyone and they were all fighting, you know, Russia, the Holy Roman Empire, the beginnings of Prussia, Netherlands, Denmark, Sweden. And so it, it just seemed like a matter of time before the Swedish army extended and other countries saw an opportunity to invade as Denmark did, which they regretted, but then... Yeah, so I love learning about this, and it, it really does give a peek uh, into kind of what's happening in the East. We've been, I'm so focused on France and Britain and whatnot. He was determined to take it back, and when that was done, it was necessary to make it so that the Commonwealth would never again fall victim to another deluge, but that in the next episode. Thanks there to the one? cast and crew for making... Oh, the deluge part three right here. All right, I will do this. Next it was time, a conflict. is there a part four? All right, I will continue this later. I'll post this tomorrow. And uh, yeah, awesome. Love it. Filling in some, or getting rid of some fog of war. Sorry if I'm a bit tired. It is Christmas day and it's been a long day, but I got through that. I absorbed it nicely. See you guys next time.